and that's where we started doing um doing chips and that's something that we're going to be getting into when we come up here we start talking about things like uh like monostable and bistable and ostable right what the hell does that mean and it's like well like a monostable vibrator, if you will, is like a one-shot trigger, you know, a Schmidt trigger style. And there's a reason why you would do that. But a bistable, believe it or not, it are your register sets like uh, like flip-flops, like RS flip-flops and JK flip-flops. Those are bistable multi-vibrators when you get down to it. Yeah, they're digital, but in the reality of the thing, it's really, it's, a, it's, a, it's another multi-vibrator, which is something that we're going to get into in a little bit here. <clears throat> um, and the reason you would do something like that is all about uh, timing. So like a one shot, like a Schmidt trigger, why would you need something like that? Well, you literally lay it out for like a, a specific sequence of events. Let's say you didn't want to capture everything. You wanted to capture only when this occurs, right? So you set up a one shot and um, so you get the proper signal mix and then it generates out a pulse which feeds down later circuitry, it says, yes, this is the signal to grab. Otherwise, don't turn on and, and reject all this garbage, you know, otherwise you're just getting crap, you know, noise and whatnot. But we get a certain condition set, we'll set it up and go, oh, boom, here we go, and now we grab this. And then it's, and <clears throat> five, five, five timers are like that. But the cool thing with a five, five, five timer is you can set it up for, you know, the monostable um, situation or, set it up for bi-stable or my favorite one, the us-stable. And us-stable is, um, <laughs> uh, it's always so fun to try to explain this without the math. Um, the us-stable one is a little different in that it doesn't have any unique condition to it. It just, um, you could kind of set it to be a variant, if you will, to accept like different types of frequencies. I don't know. Uh, we get into so many things. We can even get into, and I am sorry, guys, about uh, about Monday. My damn, you know, I never realized how crappy my internet service was until I had to start doing this. You know, living out in the country, it was one of the rustic things about it. It's like, oh, we're going to be without power for two days. How awesome is this? And, and in a way, it's kind of cool. In a way, it kind of sucks. But um, But yeah, the same with my internet. I believe it or not. And this hasn't even been that long. When I first was out here, we didn't have um, DSL or anything like that. All we had was uh, like a radio broadcast. They got like this little mini tower out here. And, um, and I think my overall bandwidth was about, at the maximum, was about three, three giga. Uh, yeah, about three, I think it is. Now I got a 13... Uh, 13 Mbps uh, download speed, which is woo, but from compared to like, and this is, and you had to pay a little extra to get the three Mbps, okay? But now we've got um, a 13 Mbps, and that's DSL. There is no cable company out here at uh, at the lake. They've got uh, cable about five miles away in the nearest town, but out by me, we have no cable service. Um, we had like Dish and all that, but I got rid of that, and I do. Uh, nothing but streaming now that now that we can we have a reliable connection but yeah my internet in the beginning you know during interesting days it was like your internet would go nice and slow and then otherwise it would do okay but streaming no that was unheard of unless you like sitting there and watching something for a minute and then waiting about three minutes for it to download <laughs> the next set yeah but anyway <coughs> so we're continuing on here i guess we'll get this Class sort of going. I got a little, um, oh God, let's see here. Just a slight, oh, it's always so hard for me to see. I think this is what I want. We can all see that. I mean, we look at opt amps, and I mean, at the heart of it, we got this basic set here, right? <coughs> no resistors on it or anything like that. And we're able to compute out our overall gain as a one. It's a simple buffer <coughs> or voltage follower, we call it that. Um, Please, Daddy. I said, no. Daddy. <laughs> See, I love this at home stuff. Who's got kids? Green eggs and ham. I do. Dad. 
I'm, I'm, I'll mute us and just listen. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, but yeah, we get simple circuits, you know, voltage follower rate, and one of our golden rules here, E plus equals and follows E minus. So our voltage potential, what's going to be here, is going to be here with no resistor to set with the, you know, the overall gain. Our gain is going to be, you know, one. But if we look at like our, our circuitry, if you will, we find here, you know, our two classic styles, the non-inverting and inverting, where you got a single input. And I mean, you notice the similarity in both cases, right? Is we tie the feedback, even when we do the, uh, the non-inverting versus the inverting style, notice that the feedback loop is always tied to the inverting input here, right? See that? We have that and we've got that. The only difference is our relationship. So with the non-inverting, of course, if we put an analog signal in phase for phase, it's gonna match up. And then if we use the inverting style, phase for phase, it's gonna be 180 degrees out of phase. But, and these are our two classic formulas depending on the values of our two resistors, the input resistor and the feedback resistor. And again, our golden rules still always apply. We have a massive uh, impedance potential right across here, always calling it bolted down, a virtual ground. And something I always say, but what the hell does that mean, right? When I say E plus equals and follows E minus. Well, and because of the virtual ground effect being here, what it means is that the voltage here is the voltage here. So E plus equals and follows E minus. So that means that the voltage here, even if you have a ground point like this here, still has the potential here, right? Because of the virtual ground or the way it's laid out internally. <coughs> it's just a matter of how it works with the feedback loop. And that's why in this case, both cases, we have a feedback loop tied to the inverting input, if you will, because the voltage that exists here is gonna be the voltage that exists here. And it's not necessarily always the case with the this style, right? Because if E plus equals and follows E minus, then if we ground him out, well, he's literally just going to do whatever he does. And then we basically come to a, what they call a bridge circuit. And this is all looking at it earlier, just like a little review, right? And this is we all what we call our, our linear responses, if you will. Very predictable. We know what they're going to give us out. Um, we don't have any special conditions to worry about or anything like that. In this case, we use both styles together, right? So what do we have? We have one tight end where we have the um, inverting input and the non-inverting input, and both of outputs tied together in a bridge um, formation, if you will. So this means that we have both formulas in effect, right? So if we look at what was our gain for A1, it would be the inverting style where you have the mi minus R2 over R1. And if we look in the secondary circuit, we see that we use the one plus R3 over R4 formula. And then we have to do a combination because we have the outputs tied in with the bridge here. So literally, I mean, we could play with the formulas if you'd like to. We could see that A1 minus A2 and plug in these two values here and come up with an overall of what our output is going to be. <clears throat> but like I said, I don't want to get really crazy in the math with you guys, but I do want you to realize that this is what's occurring with these circuits. And we'll go with a voltage adder style. Um, you can see that we still have the RF or RI uh, combination going on, right? We have the closed loop, closed loop gain going on. Um, with, with the voltage adder, what we have done is we've taken the input resistor and cascaded it. And we could do this forever if we wanted to, as long as uh, the resistors are corresponding. Well, you don't have to make the values equivalent. It does make it a lot easier for doing the math to keep each value of resistance equivalent here. But if we vary it, we can do the math for that as well, but you would have to literally solve for each line, combine them together, and figure out what your overall voltage input would be. But that's what they consider a voltage adder or a mixer, right? The subtractor, is a little different. There we use both inputs of the op amp 
and literally let them fight it out. <coughs> Excuse me. So your formulas still apply and always, 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 E plus equals and follows E minus. And that kind of sets the tone for us here. So in the case of this, right, we would still have to plug in our, our gain formula, if you will, but we would have to take the difference of these two voltages like that. They would literally fight it out, whichever one, you know, has the greater amplitude wins, right? <laughs> And then we do something called a comparator. And in this case, and a comparator is an interesting circuit. Um, we like to set that up to basically make a trigger event. You don't want anything to come on the output until you're, you reach a certain voltage level. And you can set that up and that's what this does. It has a voltage reference. They're, they're useful in power supplies where you want the power supply to only kick out an output when it has like five volts per se, or 12 volts or 24 volts or whatever the power supply is supposed to be delivering. And then what it'll do is it'll look at the, uh, the uh, voltage being given out by the power supply itself and comparing it to an internal reference, right? So let's say if we had it as five volts, we'll only get um, an output here if that thing, right, we got our statement where V in is greater than V rep. So if it comes in and it's like four volts, no output. And what, and what that is, is like a safety circuit, if you will. It'll literally keep the thing from turning on or giving an output because the condition hasn't been reached. But once it does get reached, and you'd be amazed that this particular thing is usually without component failure, you know, just typical like electrolytic capacitors or something like that just getting out over time with age or, or, or heat, you know, misuse. <clears throat> if you exceed the heat of a, uh, of a given um, device over time, of course, it's going to fail, right? They all have their own operating ranges. And if you've gone above and beyond that, well, yeah, you've just shortened the life of your device. You can expect it to fail. Mm -hmm. But, um, but this, but this one, you uh, very typically what will happen is, uh, what you have providing the voltage reference will give out and then um, this thing will fail. So you'll never ever reach, if your B rep falls to zero, right? And B in has to be greater than that. Yeah, your power supply will never, ever, ever turn on. And this is a very, 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 I can't even emphasize how common that this is a failure for, um, for power supplies. Rack mount is, you know, dep depending on where you're at and everything. <laughs> but that's just like a review of what we're looking at, like in the linear world. And then we start coming up in what we call the, like the multivibrator effects, right? Where it's a nonlinear thing. And that's what we've been looking at. Let me stop sharing that. As we start getting into this next chapter. And yes, I am posting the homework today. I do have a couple of labs I will have posted today that will, uh, that you can go through with this and they can, you know, they work very pretty well with the simulator and whatnot. Um, but yeah, as we go on, we'll look, I mean, let's see here, I know exactly where, because in Frenzel's thing, he literally jumps, you know, right into the, uh, pull this up here, you know, he starts talking with these, with the filters and whatnot, right, and, um, and generally starts talking, and, and this is the one, see, you, you would have no idea how hard this is to explain to you guys without actually getting into the math, okay, of what first order and second order and whatnot are, and it's all a degree of harmonics. Um, see, there was a guy back when, French guy, um, goes, went by the name, of, his last name was Fourier, right, F-O-U-R-I-E-R. And he did an interesting thing that was called, and, and in fact, uh, the math model is even used to this day. If you take any kind of communications class, I promise you, you will run into Fourier analysis. So what he does is, let me stop this for a second. And I found a circuit I can help explain it a little bit for you. If I can get this pulled up. All right. Oh, Jesus. Hold on a second here. So, 
we, when we talk about first order, second order, third order, fourth, or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, in a Fourier analysis, what he did was, it, I mean, and look at it like a, when we generate out a square wave, okay? Square wave does not exist in nature. Nature does not make square waves. Nature makes sine waves. It's all smooth, you know, even if they're different varying frequencies, sound waves, sound waves are sine waves. Um, you know, everything that you have in nature, the big boom the lightning makes comes out as a sine wave. This is all analog response. <clears throat> so when we make a square wave, um, we're doing something not in nature. So if we look at this circuit, everybody can see this pretty good? All right, so you notice what we have here, okay? And an interesting thing with Fourier analysis is we ignore what they call like second order, fourth order, sixth order, eighth order, and so on. And what we go with is first, third, fifth, seventh, ninth, eleventh, da 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 So if we look at something like this, okay, so notice, all right, if we look at our sine wave, which is the biggest one is this nice big orange sine wave here going here, right? Well, let's look at that. We have a 1K resistor. They all have um, different frequencies as well going in here, right? One kilohertz, three kilohertz, five, seven, and so on. And then this is all coming out of the output of this op amp, okay? But notice the trigger effect is all by the first order sine wave. See the orange one? So we have this tied into the inverting input of the, of the op amp, right? So it's reversed order. So when this one's high, the square wave generation is low. And when this one's low, the square wave generation is high. <clears throat> but now, and this, this square wave kind of sucks, right? It's kind of not real smooth or anything like that. For that, we would just crank through, you know, again, using more orders of the sine waves to fill out the square wave, if you will. And the more we use, the smoother it gets. But all of these sine waves here are literally making the square wave, if you will. And if we wanted a tighter transition, we would have to tighten it up. We could do that with um, capacitors and whatnot and make our edges really like a knife edge, if you will, real sharp. But for basic uh, demonstration, this works pretty well. So our green is our output, which is, if you can see it, I know this is all crazy, right? But the green is the output, which is the square wave. And that's literally being made by all these sine wave inputs. And you'll notice, so we have one kilohertz, three kilohertz, five kilohertz, seven, nine, 11, and 13, all the odd numbers. Because we reject um, all the even numbers. And this is something that you would get if we did the math. We could literally take up uh, all week doing a Fourier analysis of a square wave, you know, with the math of the derivatives involved. <clears throat> but we won't do that. <laughs> we'll just look at this example being made. And again, like I say, this is really what we mean when we talk about harmonics and, uh, and what is occurring. So we just look at a cascade out, right? So bandwidth effect of how our relationship is with these frequencies. And how we can crank out a square wave with that. And this is a very simple model, but yeah, it's very typical of, of square wave generation. So when you get your, like your generator, right? Sitting on your lab bench and you go and tell it, okay, give me a square wave or give me a triangular wave or whatnot. It's starting, I mean, it's getting the, the, the electricity out of the wall. So it's starting with a sine wave. So how do, how do it do it? And literally this is how it does it. And this is what we mean when we start talking, because when we get into like the nonlinear functions, we start looking at AC responses with op amps, right? And I, like I say, I really hate the way Frenzel does this, but um, I'll go back here, share screen. But when he talks about first order stages, he's talking about that primary frequency, if you will, okay? And they call it, and, there's, and we'll run, start running into more names that have had impacts in electronics over the years. Butterworth filter response. We'll be talking about Schmidt triggers, if you will, and things like that. Um, but this is really, um, you have to look at it in like the IC, R, uh, for me, RC time constant, if you will, of how you can respond. And now we've noticed that up to this point that we have a pretty wide um, bandwidth capability of an op amp, right? 
where we can accept a, quite a few uh, frequency range, if you will. So everybody able to see that okay? Do I need to, even I can see that okay. But if we look at our frequency, right? So let's say we set this one up, a low pass, non-inverted unity gain. Unity gain being what? Our amplification is gonna be one. But by low pass, that means what do we want? We just wanna pass low frequencies and reject all high frequencies or mid-range frequencies, if you will. And how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna do that with our C time constant, right? So we set up our cutoff frequency, F of C, to be equal to one over two pi RC, right? That's our figuring out our IT, uh, RC time constant, if you will. And then we can set our values of R and C accordingly for this particular circuit. And we can do a low pass non-inverting, we can do low pass inverting with some slight gain to it. You know, there's a variety of things that we can do with this. And these again are nonlinear responses. We can set up high pass filters as well. And now the thing to think about, and remember here, like previously in your AC classes, you had you had similar circuits where you only had like the R, R and the C in there, right? No, no op amp thrown in there but those are considered passive filters. They're literally waiting for something to happen. <laughs> and when you do that though, you have to think about that. What is happening is if you have something waiting to respond, so that means that there's always gonna be a slight delay in response, right? Nothing's instantaneous. Whereas if you have what they call an active filter, this thing is already turned on. It's not waiting for something to happen. It's happening. Whether you have a signal there for it to happen on or not, it's still energized, right? So that's what we mean by an active type filter. And then that's why we use an op amp and are very, very popular to use for filters because they're there, they're already happening. The minute a signal comes in there, there's no delay in response. It's, it's responding, right, immediately. And so then we get into, you know, he starts talking about the second order low pass filters, where now, uh, 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 uh. and see, and this is, ah, oh boy, I hate this guy so much. <laughs> so we had a little formula where we can figure out our voltage output in relationship to our capacity to charge, okay, where V out could equal um, our Q divided by RC. So when we talk about Q, we're talking about Q of the charge or what our charge capability is able to be, okay? So when we talk about like, so we say each second order stage has a resonant frequency and a Q to determine how much peaking occurs to it. So our, our Q in this case is our capacity to charge, if you will. So we have this um, low pass circuit and you can see here that our Frequency peak or peak frequency is set up by both of the capacitors in this case and our value of R correspondingly. And so our, our notice here is the Q formula and Q, okay, so if V is equal to Q over C, if we juggle that around a little bit, right, then Q would be equal to what? V divided by C. So our relationship if we look at the way this is, remember now, we have a virtual ground point being established here from the op amp inputs, right? So we have to, if we redesign our model, if you will, and establish a ground point at this point, what does that do in our RC relationships here? <coughs> so in this case, we're saying that we have a, a voltage value of half a volt coming in, and then we're gonna take our square root without getting really deep into the math of it all, right, that of C1 to C2 relationship and come up with our ability or our capacity to charge in this particular circuit. So what that is is sort of like a, a frequency response, right? If we're capacity to charge, and we know what an AC signal that a capacitor is gonna ramp up, you know, charge up and discharge, charge up and discharge over time, right? So we have to look at our capacity for that and how is our response going to be? And I promise you the one thing with having an active filter versus having a passive filter, our response is much, much cleaner and much smoother and much faster than we would if we would go with a passive style. So if we get like into cases where we're dealing with, you know, higher frequencies and we want a higher response, 
this is the way to go. Something simple, yeah, you can get away with like a simple RC, you know, uh, filter, you know, passive filter without an op amp bender and whatnot. But nine times out of 10, in any kind of active uh, electronics you have out there, you're very, very typically gonna run into the active filters, high pass, low pass, band pass, all pass, you know, basically everything that you had going through the, the AC classes as far as filters. Yeah, you get that with the active filters as well. <coughs> so the high pass versus the low pass. How, we, well, we can see if we look back, oh, my bad, where our capacitor repl uh, placement is with our resistors, right? Dictates how we're gonna respond. And notice in a high pass, it's just a flip-flop of how they are. Now our circuit now becomes this. So if we look at our formula here, right? Now we have what? One over two pi C with the square root of R1 and R2 relationship established because of the virtual ground versus this style, okay? Where we had two pi R with the square root of C1 and C2. And that's just the way you'd be able to recognize, am I dealing with a low pass or am I dealing with a high pass? And then basically you would just wanna plug in that particular formula to find out what your overall response is going to be, right? Does that make sense? Kind of, sort of, sort of, kind of? I, I, this chapter is really kind of goofy. I don't wanna like really, really dwell on it a little, a lot. I wanted to kind of do some labs just so you have the idea of that. Because what it does kind of set us up for is um, when we go into oscillators. So when we start, you know, generating outer waveforms and things like that, where um, <coughs> we do have to be familiar with how the filters are laid out, how our RC response is, and um, what our Q capabilities are of a particular circuit. So that way, when we do start generating out sine waves and things like that, how are we dealing with it? What is our time base for it? That kind of thing. <laughs> but again, I, I don't care a whole lot for how he goes into this. Um, but that's essentially what we're looking at. So really he focuses more, and they're the more commonly used ones, right? Where you have low pass and high pass filters are, um, com by comparably, are the, more, are the ones you would run into more often than not. <clears throat> and an interesting thing, that if we look at the value of Q relationship to this, right? that um, if our Q value comes up to a charge potential less than one, then this has an impact in how our uh, low pass and high pass relationship are. So in that case, we have a much wider frequency response, if you will, if our, if our capacity to charge is below one. If we, our Q goes over one, okay, that relationship, we now come into a very, very tight bandwidth where we're gonna be very, very frequency specific. And it has its uses as well. I mean, both of them have their uses. And if we look at it like a graph response, it's like, okay, what the hell does that mean? Well, in a high pass filter, right, we reject all low frequencies and only allow the upper frequencies here. And we start seeing uh, some response right at the cusp of the knee here. And the same with low pass, just in reverse. And then we get what they call the band pass, where we have a specific band available to us. So in this case, in this case, we would want to look at that Q value more, okay? And then if our Q started to go up greater than one, then we start approaching something along this, where we have a very limited bandwidth, if you will. If that makes sense, I hope that does, I really do. And we get something, well, where we do a placement of capacitors across here and we do the multi-feedback. And this is kind of like a, a band pass, you know, an all pass style filter where we're allowed to have a, a variety of frequencies go through it. Not as commonly used um, on radio communications and tele television communication. Generally type, uh, like to stick with a particular type where we're either dealing with high pass or low pass filtering responses. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, we do have um, cases out there where we do deal with like, you know, in some audio where we have a multi-feedback stage, if you will. And in this case, our Q uh, capability is gonna be greater than one. So that means we're gonna be dealing with what? Probably a tight bandwidth for it, okay? Um, and in this case, we're tied into the inverting input. So we can expect our output to be inverted in this case. 
And that's why we're going to look at our gain formula. We're using the inverting style one. We set up what is our Q, uh, our capacity of charge going to be. In this case, our Q is, and this is a very standard formula, pretty much these three. And again, you know, depending on the filter, and that's, that would change the relationship of C and R, if you will, and just how we're approaching it. But we won't, we won't get into like real deep in the math on how the virtual ground is affecting us and which way the math gets us placed. We'll come out with just general formulas, if you will. And that way we could just, you know, depending on the circuit we're dealing with, what type of frequency cutoff that we're gonna have or what kind of frequency cutoff formula we're going to use. And band stop is like a block band. If you wanna reject specific bands, um, useful for like uh, noise rejection and that kind of thing, unwanted, un uh, stray signals, if you will. Um, and then you start talking a little bit, yeah, with the band stop or even notch filtering. And a notch filter has a very, very tight um, range to it, if you will. <coughs> so it literally almost looks like, you know, it's rejecting everything but this particular, and it'll come up in a very tight swing and only allow that one to pass through. But with all the filters, um, we always come up with some type of RC relationship. And we can always, you know, generalize and say, okay, RF is always going to be one over two pi RC. It's just a matter of the relationship in the circuit itself. And with remembering that we do have this virtual ground point being established here. And that's only a way to look at it, you know, just always like mentally try to draw a little ground symbol right there and be able to go, okay. Yeah, we've got that ground there because if those things, instead of being like a series relationship, right, it's going to be more of a parallel style, if you will. <coughs> and the band stops are, are tricky. They, they have a very tight use to them. As you can see here, you know, as AV approaches two, the circuit becomes uh, impractical and will start oscillating. It will literally just start generating out its own frequencies um, without inputs and whatnot, if you will. So we don't like to use this one very, very often. In fact, most of these we don't like to use um, just because of their uh, limitations, if you will. And then you get the, uh, the all-pass filter, and it'll pass all frequencies, no attenuation, right? So no uh, signal degradation is happening here. Um, but yeah, it can control the phase of the output signal. Um, we could try to use it as a time delay, you know, give it a little kickback, if you will. And the reason being, it would, you could set up like triggering responses to allow further circuitry down the line to give time to accept these signals that would be coming through with it. And they become rather interesting. And in, in, in all these cases, it's really a matter of where we place our, uh, our capacitance and relationship to our resistance. And in this particular one, you notice that we're using both inputs, okay, which means we'll be using both formulas we would have both you know, the, the minus RF over RI um, occurring, while we'll also have the one plus RF over RI occurring here. And because of the tie-in, they're both receiving the signals and what our relationship to the VL. Again though, notice that our feedback loop is always tied into the inverting, the inverting input right here. You know, we won't get, uh, I don't want to start getting into doing trigonometry with you guys and everything. It's a little above and beyond our scope with this and everything like that. Typically, what we would want to do is stick with just what our overall frequency response is, how we calculate what our AB is going to be, um, and that type of thing. The you know, LPS filter is simple, um, and it will it allow pretty much every frequency to go through it. It's just a matter of response time, if you will. And like he says in here, right, there will be a certain time delay and that's based on your RC time constant. So you could have a quick response, a slower response. It really depends on who your design parameters would be and what you're going for. <coughs> and so this one passes all first order frequencies, right? And the, the thing about these two is, you know, the, the good thing that we like to use for filters is, yeah, it's gonna allow first order um, frequencies through. So if we get something that's like distorted, we're getting like some feedback on the line and that type of thing, what's going to happen is we will allow the first order signal through. We might have a little trouble with like the third and the fifth and so on, which is very typical of a filter. 
if you will, and why we would want to use them. It's kind of like trying to block out all uh, any and all unwanted frequencies, and that um, and that uh, not just um, like external noises, but internally generated ones. Like you've seen, like in a case like some of our earlier amplifiers, right? We had like the small signal amplifiers and whatnot that were very, very susceptible to distortion, even to the point where like the class A, the class A was, you know, 26% efficiency, which means it's really noisy. It's gonna have a lot of distortion on it and things like that. So we attempt to try to clean these signals up for, for usage and we use these varying filters depending on what kind of frequencies we're dealing with. So when we say first order frequency, what we're really allowing through is just the original signal, if you will, and not any echoes that are occurring on the line, just because of feedback. If that makes, I hope that makes sense. And I mean, that really ties up this chapter in this. And then what we end up happening is we go from this and we start going into, um, into oscillators, right? Let me see here, hold on one second. I got, uh, Some of the other stuff that's going to be, uh, there we go, is how we look at the relationships with this. Let's see if I can close this up and share that. So going back a little bit, I'm looking at like how comparators work and stuff. This is a little clearer model, if you will. I remember comparison, the comparator is um, ideally because we have that ground potential being established here, right? That E plus equals and follows E minus. So voltage here is voltage here. Um, so in this case, what we have going into the inverting input is a one volt DC signal. And then to the non-inverting input, we get a two volt peak, one kilohertz signal. Now, what kind of output would we get with something like that, okay? Now, here's what we have. So keep in mind that we're dealing with this one volt DC. And if we look at our V out, our V out in this case is the blue signal. I don't want to say square wave because the duty cycle isn't e even. It's more of a pulse, if you will. <coughs> and how does that pulse get generated? And you got to look at the way um, the reference works, you know, with our voltage point being established from here to here. So if we do a comparison, because we have that one volt DC. Now, if we look at the, the output, right, the pulse, and he's got it set to 500 millivolts looking at. So if that's 500 millivolts, that's roughly a one volt pulse, right, which is our established here. But the time cycle, if you notice with the analog, uh, with the sine wave signal going in here, that our edges only occur when, because this thing's two volt, is when it reaches the one volt mark. And it's active while that sine wave stays up and over to one volt. See how the edges line up with that? So as long as that sine wave goes over that one volt of DC, we get an output. The minute that that sine wave falls below that, uh, that one volt DC rep right there, we get nothing. It just literally falls where it goes down to, a, well, in this case, it would be the, this is the saturation voltage, right, set up by VCC and VEE. <coughs> so we got the, our cutoff there, but it would fall to that. And we could, we could go ahead and have, like, this output tied to, like, a capacitor-style network where we reject the DC and raise this up and have it go as a zero-volt baseline and use it like a, a trigger pulse, if you will. That's a very basic of how like a comparator works with, you know, a sine wave, if you will. And then do something a little bit different with this. Notice on this style one, very similar circuit, by the way, right? The only difference being we don't have a, a DC here at all. So what would our reference be considered, right? This would be a zero reference. And ta-da, hence the term, zero crossing detector. Yeah, I know, this is horrible, boring. You guys want to... You want me to keep going? Is this getting horrible for you? Is it making sense? I'm looking at air and going, oh my God, what's well, this going to go on forever? But, well, and I mean, really, we're just looking at like how, because op amps at the very basic, right, we really are only ever, ever dealing with, you know, inverting or non-inverting the adder, subtractor, comparator style circuits. It's what we do with them, though, 
especially as we start getting into you know more AC injection and RC time responses and things like that. And I just want it to be clear, you know, because if we look at comparators, they start getting complicated. But ideally, all we're ever really doing with these things, right? We're doing a KDL approach, and 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 it's the great thing about an op amp; it still has to it has to follow the rules. All we ever really want to do is, you know, Ohm's law, maybe the power rule thrown in there every now and then, and some good KDL or KCL to it. It's just a matter of how the heck we're going to look at these circuits. And that's why I say, <laughs> always and mentally in your head here, throw that ground junction in on there because it is there. It's going to it's gonna affect how the circuit looks, right, or how it's going to you know, take its input in. So we have like this R2 and a C1 happening here, and you notice they're both tied down the ground. And what happens when I tie this side to ground here as well? You know, now we've gone and thrown this whole circuit into a, a different way, and that's how we get these formulas generated. This. It's like, oh, <laughs> well, our reference voltage then is this relationship. Because if we didn't look at it as a ground input in that case, we would be looking at the R1 as being the lead here. But in reality, it's not the case at all. See how we do that? And it's like, oh, look at that. Now we're actually taking VCC with respect to the R2 as opposed to the R1. Granted, we still have to take uh, R1 and R2. And here's a little trick question for you. Since we have a DC in there, why did we not? take the capacitor into account at all. Anybody? 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 What does capacitor do at DC? Open. Exactly. Acts like a short. Short? No, short for AC, open for, uh, well, for, oh, for DC. Oh, right? yeah, I'm just keeping you on your toes, right? Making sure we, we're, we're understanding why the components are doing, why we re why we didn't even take that into account. And it's like, well, that's the reason why. Because for as far as a DC approach, he might as well not even be there. So, and that's why he doesn't come out in the formula. Just making sure everybody's awake. No. <laughs> sorry. Right. This sorry. Time of the day, it's, it's rough for me, Tom. Oh, I'm sorry. See, I wear AC. AC is going to come in here, is going to be on our input. This is establishing, right? We're doing a comparator. So this is establishing what our reference is gonna be on this side, if you will. And again, notice our duty cycle here. This is not a nice clean square wave, if you will. This is more of a uh, trigger pulse, right? It's got a specific area of range where it's active and then a great range where it is non-active. So when we start doing uh, the AC in there, this is how we would basically, okay, so we established what our reference formula would be. What's our reference voltage? So in this case, we've gone through and set up a nice steady five volt rep. So every time that this 10 volt peak signal rises up and over five, right, we will get a trigger pulse out. And any other time, it's simply saying, nope, not enough there. So it will not turn on, simply because E plus equals and follows E minus. And because of that relationship, we're able to do things like this where we can literally play and have two separate inputs and have them compare to each other and generate out an output, uh, uh, a desired output for us. <coughs> so for whatever reason, we're only interested in, in this pulse when this occurs. So for whatever, you know, depending on our circuitry, what it's hooked into, this is, this is the ideal performance mode. And we shoot out a pulse, like a trigger pulse to say, okay, this is when it's happening. And this could be for a variety of reasons. You know, and again, the same thing, right? Non-zero reference. We look at it, okay. And in this case, we have a negative. And basically, we're tied around the BE in this case and just throw a couple of components in there, if you will. And again, we have a B input for our AC signal. <coughs> now we get one, all right. Um, and LTP to UTP is trigger point. So the, the way to look at this, so if we have this trigger point here and a trigger point here, right? Again, setting it up sort of like a reference, right? So this one is a reference on this side for this particular op amp, and this one is a reference on this side for this particular op amp. And we have an op, uh, an op amp. We have a input coming into here that will be going into, and notice we're using the inverting up here and the non-inverting down here. 
So this reference will establish us a particular range, if you will, almost, um, I don't know, it would depend on the signal really, but we look at what our range is on this thing. So the LTP, we can look and say, okay, it'll be active when this condition occurs and our UTP will be active when this condition occurs. So really it's looking at for an ideal trigger signal if, um, to come in on this line. Uh, let's say if it's like an arbitrary unknown signal of a variety of sorts, and we're only looking for a very particular uh, signal out of that to respond to, this would be an ideal circuit to set up for that. <coughs> and again, these are all um, looking at ways to AC, you know, respond to AC. It goes a little better, I think, examples than uh, what friends all had. Just looking at, you know, simple RC network. How does the op amp deal with it? And so we set up in the same deal. Everybody remember what tau is? What is tau normally equal to? If I had time constants out there? No. Well, so tau is the equivalent of five time constants. So when I say like this T in this case, what I can say is tau, a Greek letter, right, is equal to five of those t's, if you will. So in this particular case, we get a period response. We set up t, and it could be whatever it is. Let's say in this case, one second. Tau would be five of those one second. So in this case, we'd be saying, okay, our t is one second here. But in this case, we're going to set tau, and that would be five seconds. And then that would be the way you would plug into that circuit. Or in this case, he sets a rule, right? So he says tau is when it's greater than 10 T. And it's usually, you know, it depends on how you're dealing with the tau and the, and the charging and discharging of the circuit itself. <coughs> Excuse me. But just a little, make sure everybody's awake. Make sure you're awake, wake, wake, wake. But the integrator kind of, a little different. He gets, uh, in this case, we get a, uh, Notice we're getting in a, a square wave style pulse, if you will, but our output is a ramp style that is only active while the pulse is high. And that's because of the charge uh, discharge effect of the capacitor here. And the amount of time that would take is set up by the RC, our time constant and dealing with the gain formula of this thing, if you will, right? Well, like I said, we won't get a lot into that. Um, but what the integrator does for us, like in this case, so we've seen, I showed you that one picture of how we can use the harmonics and go through and with a series of sine waves, we can crank out a square wave. Well, in this particular case, we use basically capacitive response to take a square wave and kick us out a triangular wave. So on your function generators, these basically are re all real circuits that are actually incorporated into the function generator. So when you push that button for like, triangular wave out or you know the pulses out and that kind of thing these are the cert kind of circuits you're going to have behind that that are actually telling it what to do so we figure out okay so what's our slope response right of the triangular wave in response to the square wave we go and look at um, our time rc time constant in this case tight end <coughs> excuse me so the square wave gets generated through and we have a zero reference mark so we don't have to worry about that um and we look at what? The rising edge and the trailing edge of the square wave or the pulse, if you will. So basically as the square wave leading edge comes in, capacitor, right? Charges up, discharges, and we get the nice clean thing coming out. And that's basically because of the operation of the op amp itself. And again, and it occurs, so rising and falling. It's a real simple circuit, um, real nice and easy to use. We can, you know, and you can vary it depending on your value of the capacitor and resistor you use in the circuit. <coughs> and again, we can use that with like pulses, if you will, and get out triangular wave response based on a trigger pulse. And these are all timing generators. And, and the only reason we start to look at these is we're gonna start getting into oscillators in the next chapter. Oh, by the way, because of all this, I'm not gonna do a, a quiz on this particular chapter. We'll do uh, the quiz on the following one when we get into oscillation, start looking at uh, frequency responses and such like that. And that's when we start leading in and I'm gonna kinda sort of draw to a close on here as we start getting into 
oscillators. And again, if it, but all this is going to be is just um, a juggling around of RC time constants, where we place R, where we place C is how it comes out in the formula. And, re, and keeping in mind, remember, you know, how we're dealing with how um, capacitors deal with like DC voltage, if you will, what happens to them, right? They're shorted out with a D, just a straight DC response. And then how does a capacitor react when we're dealing with the AC and, and that type of thing. And remember, always, always remember with these circuits that even though it's not there, remember to draw that virtual ground point right here, if you will. And that will set you up on how we get to the formulas that we do get to in this case. Does that make sense? I mean, and then we start, and eh, we're not going to do this. Um, but we'll start getting into, and the reason that we use these styles, notice that we do still have a, a diode thrown in there to give us like the clipping effect, if you will. So even though we have like a half wave rectifier, and we know that we can make a half wave rectifier out of just diodes, they tend to be inefficient, if you will, right? So why would we want to have uh, an op amp go through this? More efficiency, better response, if you will, higher current, that type of thing. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna kill you guys with that. No, no, no. But I will have uh, the homework posted. It'll be coming up today, I promise you. And then uh, probably post the other chapter homework as well. Because we will be going through and starting to get in, you know, all the AC responses with these and our different um, triggers and, and such. Oh, I'm not responding to chat at all today, huh? Oh, Ben, okay. Ben was out. I missed it. Dang it. I had too many windows going on here today. But do, do, do op amps, are, are op amps making sense to you guys? Is this, I mean, without getting really heavy duty into the math, if you will, I don't want to, I, I don't want to do that. I mean, in some cases you do need the math to help explain what is going on. <coughs> and I mean, when we get down to these circuits, really what we're dealing with, right? We got um, essentially three type of things that we have to really worry about as far as like our gain effect right with uh, amplifiers we either have ad gain we have ai gain and we have ap gain so depending you know which one we're concerned with so if we have voltage gain occurring so if you look at a circuit and it doesn't have any particular voltage gain and we go oh that's unity gain and stuff but again how does that affect what the current is and something like that so we could have a, an amplifier that has a unity gain, but at the same time, it has a high current gain. And that could be useful if I wanted to take like a low power signal and give it a lot of a good current boost without changing really the original voltage signal to it at all, that type of thing. And then um, as far as signal boosts and, and comparators, giving us references and things like that is primarily where the, um, where the linear world works. And then when we say when we start getting into the nonlinear world is when we start getting into um, like frequency generations and things like that, if you will. Let's see here. Oh, did that share? See, very typical, right? You get what, like they say, the, the multi vibrator, which is a very sim, you know, very simple circuit set up and how it, it generates out. You notice this particular one is generating out its own signal, right? But that's the type of thing we'll be looking at, it's just Schmidt trigger comparators, but we're dealing with like AC signals in. <clears throat> and like I said, I don't want to do the math real heavy on here with this because some of it does, we start getting into calculus and derivatives and things like that. And it's, it, it becomes, you know, beyond the scope of this class. But really all I want to deal with is like how the clocks are occurring, you know, and what our relationship as far as RC time constants are concerned. How we can turn like an, you know, sine wave into a square wave, square wave into a triangular wave and that type of thing. And that's, that'll lead us up into getting into Frenzel's chapter on, on oscillators. And then we'll be able to do oscillators and we'll go look at the wristers, which is a little different style of a semiconductor device. But it's somewhat popular, actually, 
and then hope we ended up with the um, the 555 timers real quick here so i mean we won't spend a lot of time on the thrusters it's it's they're they're pretty specific device and, you know they have certain rules to them that's a little different um and as far as these clock frequency ones they all pretty much follow the, uh, the same set of rules it's just a matter of where the capacitors are and resistors are placed as far as what formulas you're going to use in a particular case and what type of output you can expect it to be now anyway but that's my that's my spiel for today i'm sorry i don't want to i wanted to be a little bit ahead at this point i probably might i don't know how to do this yet but uh, with the opium thing but i'm gonna try to post uh things today and then tomorrow and have everything caught up for you guys and then um then we'll jump into <coughs> frenzel's next chapter right we'll be going into chapter 38 and going on from there 38 and 39 for sure but any questions on this so far are we doing okay with all of this is our op amps making sense so i can't see anybody's faces so i don't know if we have puzzles or or what we have going on The only thing I'm wondering about is we've got three more classes left. What's uh, what's it going to look like? Is there only three more? They are in the yeah. mirror, aren't they? The 18th is a Monday, and that's supposed to be the last day of spring semester. All right. Shit. All right. Well, that changes some things for me. Yeah, because doesn't that cut us like a week short of what we would normally would have had then? Yeah. It cuts us a day short. A day short, I mean. Yeah. So, so instead of having two full weeks and two class four classes, we have three classes. Right. Okay. Well, in that case. Well, in that case, we'll have to jump um something really quick take a little break from you, so Yeah, because I wasn't planning, okay, because we're not planning on doing chapter 41 at all. Um, 38 is definitely the oscillators and, uh, and frequency synthesis, if you will. It's basically how we can generate signals out. Um, and if you guys want to go over that today, you can. Because then chapter 39, the chapter 39 is regulated power supplies. And believe it or not, that is not all that difficult. A lot of time, a lot of what we're dealing with on the regulated power supplies is looking at their overall efficiency and both on like the transistor style and dealing with the uh, op amps and it's just like a juggling of uh, whether we have like the Darlington pair where they work together or if we have the differential style where they work opposed and with an op amp in there for uh, regularity. So I definitely want to cover chapter 38 and then I definitely want to cover chapter 40 because that's SCRs and that is something you guys will, I mean, that's a four layer diode, if you will, where it's a little different. So we can go in and, because I wanted to post the, the homework for chapter 38, I was going to post today as well. But if you want, did you want to, we can cover that. I'm, I am totally up for that. It depends on 
how much you guys can handle all at once. <laughs> Look, since I missed um, the Monday lecture, this is what's yeah set me back this one. Um, yeah, do you guys want to take a little break and uh, and we can jump into chapter thirty eight and take a look at that. Sorry. Hold on. All right. So, all right, let's do that. I will, uh, like I said, I'll have the chapter 37 and 38 homework posted today. We'll definitely expect four more labs coming up then. Um, and possibly a fifth one with the 555 timer set up for, uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, for a monostable vibrator um, thing. So I think Bob was setting them up for the bistable which is like doing it flip-flop style or square wave generator, if you will, but we'll be doing it a little differently. And then, um, and I think that'll have us all back on track and I'll post um, next Monday, we'll have the 37, 38 combined quiz and then we'll have to do probably a review over everything and then get ready for the final, I guess, would be how we would do this approach. And will those labs be due Friday or Monday? I will make them due on Monday. How would that be? Would that work with everybody's time schedule? It works fine. All right. Works for me, Tom. All right. So let's do that. And then I'll, uh, like I say, and really I'll, a lot of this is only going to be, like I say, dealing with RC time constants and how the op amp deals with it. And so really, the biggest trick of all of the whole thing and doing like circuit recognition is just looking at what you know, how the placements are of our, you know, the resistors with relations to the capacitors, whether we're dealing with, you know, low pass, high pass, or all pass type filtering effects. And that'll just basically give us the three types of formulas that we would use. I mean, they're all very similar, which becomes a pain in the butt because they are all very similar. It's easy to get them confused, but we'll have it laid out and we'll have um, each one so low pass, you know, low pass formulas, high pass formulas, and all pass formulas. And then that way we'll be able to get through the, the whole signal generation and whatnot. And then we'll go with the, uh, with the thristors and stuff. All right. And yeah, we'll make the labs due on uh, Monday. Yeah, I'll be looking for, uh, I'll be, you guys be looking for those over the next like couple hours and I'll be posting up, like I say, 37 and 38 homeworks. And then, uh, I'll set the quiz for being available on Monday and that way you can get through the homeworks and we'll get through these, the labs we have posted and that way we're all caught up and uh, on track with all this good stuff. Sound good? Silence is yes again? No, just kidding. Um, so yeah, that's how we'll do that. And then hopefully we'll get through all of this with no problem. I hope, I hope, I hope. But yeah, other way, oh, what the hell? Otherwise, I guess I will see you guys on Monday. Thanks, Tom. All right.